Hello everyone. Today I'm going to discuss medical gaslighting. What it is, what patients can do to prevent or to respond to it, and what many people get very wrong about it. First, for those of you who are new to the channel, welcome. A quick background on myself as to what my qualif qualifications are to even talk about this. I'm an academic hospitalist, which means an internal medicine physician who specializes in the care of hospitalized patients. I teach a course at our medical school on clinical reasoning, which is the process by which clinicians determine the likely disease a patient has based on their symptoms, their physical findings, and their test results. I have a video series on this channel that discusses the general approach to medical diagnosis and another series specifically on underappreciated diseases, most of which were inspired by real-life patients I had seen whose diagnoses had been delayed. A lot of what I'm going to talk about today is based upon how the healthcare system actually works, not how the system should work. Some of my advice it should not be necessary in an ideal world, but doctors and nurses are human. They are not infallible, and the healthcare system, at least here in the United States, can be a disaster. Sometimes the burden falls onto the patient to ensure they get the proper diagnosis and treatment. So when I recommend a patient do such and such, please do not infer that I necessarily think that's the way it should be. It's just what one needs to do in our current state of things. So first, what is medical gaslighting? It's most concisely defined as the experience in which a medical professional discounts a patient's concerns. These concerns can be about a specific symptom, like pain, about a diagnosis the patient suspects they have, or a specific treatment the patient is requesting. It's important to not confuse this with simply disagreeing with your doctor. If you believe you have yourself to have a particular disease, and the doctor says you don't, and the doctor provides a thorough and reasonable explanation that you don't accept, and that's not medical gaslighting, that's just disagreement. But the underappreciation and insufficient acknowledgement of patients' concerns does happen very frequently. A few weeks back, the New York Times had an article about medical gaslighting, which they promoted on Twitter by summarizing five signs that it's occurring. These are mostly a good summary of relevant patient experiences. First, your provider continually interrupts you, won't let you elaborate, and doesn't seem to be an engaged listener. Yes, that happens. It's happened to me as a patient too, and it's incredibly frustrating. Sometimes this happens because the clinician has already determined what they think is going on, possibly prematurely due to implicit bias or cognitive bias, but sometimes the clinician just has less time to speak with you than either of you would like. It's not that you aren't important, it's that there might be a dozen other patients waiting to be seen, and the clinician is just doing the best they can. You know, that's, that's not an excuse, but it is important to realize that there may be relevant external factors to what's going on in the exam room and during the encounter. Second, the provider minimizes or downplays symptoms like questioning whether you actually have pain or refuses to discuss your symptoms. Questioning whether or not you actually have pain is something that plenty of patients experience. Sometimes, again, that's implicit bias triggered by the patient's race or their gender, sexual orientation, or the presence of poverty or mental illness. Sometimes it's because a clinician doesn't have an explanation for the pain or they don't have a good strategy to treat it. And a form of cognitive bias in medicine and other things in life is to downplay what we don't understand or to ignore what we can't control. It would be nice if medical professionals were less prone to these types of biases than others, but we really aren't. I'm, uh, I'm going to come back to the third sign in a few minutes. The fourth, you feel that the provider is rude, condescending, or belittling. Yep, that definitely happens. Sometimes the clinician is just an unpleasant person. You know, I'd like to think that medical nursing and PA schools can weed out unempathetic individuals who are incapable of learning basic interpersonal skills, but some sneak through the filter. However, sometimes the clinician is responding to the patient's demeanor, or the clinician is still reacting to an unpleasant exchange three patients ago. You know, patients can say unkind things to us too, because they are understandably frustrated by their physical illness, 
or because they have unrelated mental illness, or they're experiencing medication side effects, drug addiction, delirium, or dementia. Even if the healthcare worker can identify that the patient is speaking out because, or, or lashing out, or saying things in a negative way because they're uncomfortable or scared or because they're delirious, it can still be jarring to be on the receiving end of an unexpected hostile comment or tone, and that shifts your mental state for the next handful of patients. And as common as it is for me, it's even more prevalent and worse for medical professionals who are women or persons of color. Medical nursing and PA schools now teach students a little on how to handle challenging patient encounters, but many still practicing clinicians trained before this was routine. And even now, the training in this particular set of skills is not emphasized as much as it probably should be. Next, your symptoms are blamed on mental illness, but you are neither given a mental health referral nor screened for such illness. This is something that should not happen. You know, if you have abdominal pain that's being attributed to anxiety or fatigue that's being attributed to depression, even if accurate att attributions, and that's, that is a big if, those mental health conditions, they need to be formally diagnosed themselves and they need to be properly treated. If I admit a patient to the hospital with chest pain and by the following day, I've determined it's due to panic attacks, you know, I, I don't just say, hey, great news, your heart is fine. You're just having panic attacks. Go home and just relax. You know, that patient, that person, that, that, that individual needs to receive education on panic attacks and anxiety. They need consultation with a psychiatrist and, and or psychologist. And, you know, they may need medication. So now I want to go back to the third sign according to the Times. This is a great example of what people get wrong about medical gaslighting. The provider won't order imaging or lab work to rule out or confirm a diagnosis. Medical diagnosis is hard. As I said at the beginning, I teach a course in it. There are entire textbooks about just the approach to medical diagnosis in general, not even talking about individual diseases. People dedicate entire careers to this. It's not just a matter of looking up your symptoms via a Google search and finding a disease that causes the same symptoms that you're experiencing. You know, aside from the fact that layperson-friendly medical websites are full of inaccuracies, there are many other considerations. For example, how common or rare is the disease in question? Are there risk or protective factors for the disease that are relevant for this particular person? What other diseases can cause the same set of symptoms? The problem with how the Times words this is that it suggests if a patient comes to the doctor believing they might have some disease, we as the doctors are necessarily obligated to order a test for it, and if we don't, the patient is being gaslit. No diagnostic test is perfect. There will always be a non-negligible false positive and false negative rate, meaning that the test comes back positive in a patient without the disease, or it comes back negative in one who does. One of the most important axioms in medicine is that the probability of a disease after a test result is dependent on both the test as well as on the probability of the disease before the test. For example, let's suppose a patient believes themselves to have lupus, that their doctor, with the benefit of their medical training, estimates the probability um, to be actually around 1%. At the patient's request, their physician orders a test for lupus called an ANA, a test that's very common, but which also has an infamously poor positive likelihood ratio or specificity if you prefer. Without getting into the relevant math, the probability of lupus in that patient whose ANA test is positive might increase from 1% before the test to something like 5% after the test. In other words, despite a positive test result, the patient is still unlikely to have the disease the test was looking for. But this is counterintuitive to people who don't do medical diagnosis for a living, and it will be very difficult to convince the patient of this. For a, patient, uh, for a person who's been struggling with chronic unexplained symptoms, they very quickly can become anchored to any positive test result. That's not because they are stupid or naive, but rather they are inexperienced in medical diagnosis and they are desperate for answers. It's very understandable, but it's still dangerous. First, they will now get subjected to treatment unlikely to be helpful. And second, their actual diagnosis 
is still not identified and may never be identified because the patient is now going to stop looking, which means everyone else is going to stop looking too. What should happen, of course, when a patient requests a specific diagnostic test for a highly unlikely disease that, um, is that the physician should explain why it's not indicated, but to do that properly may take more time than the physician has for the encounter. So the explanation ends up being short and can feel dismissive. So in summary, going back to this specific sign of medical gaslighting, if your provider won't order a requested test, ask them why. If they offer a thorough explanation, even if you disagree with it, that's not medical gaslighting, but rather practicing good medicine. Of course, no physician is familiar with every uh, disease or every test out there. So if you as a patient, if you feel like the disease that you suspect that you have is unusual enough that the physician is not adequately familiar with it, it's totally okay to ask the physician if they can read about it before the next visit or to ask for a referral to a relevant specialist who will be more familiar with it. The title for this video is that medical gaslighting is real, sort of. I suspect many of you watching are wondering what I mean by the sort of. Maybe you are expecting me to follow up everything I've discussed already with a big but that's going to inval uh, invalidate your experience, that's going to gaslight you about whether you've been gaslit. That is not what I'm going to do. But while the experience is very real, it's the term that's misleading and problematic. Now, outside of medicine, the term gaslighting refers to the action in which one person deliberately lies about or mis misrepresents a situation to another in order for that second person to question their own lived experience. For example, telling a woman or a person of color that an experience they've had isn't sexism or racism. Gaslighting in these contexts is deliberate and it's malicious. Now, in my admittedly biased experience, this is rarely true with what is conventionally called uh, medical gaslighting. People become doctors and nurses because of a desire to help others. Even when there exists disagreement, we don't lie to patients. We can make mistakes, we can get frustrated, we can miscommunicate, we can cut patients off, and our judgment can be affected by implicit bias. But to deliberately and maliciously lie to a patient is something I've literally seen only twice in 20 years. Now, yes, of course, that number should be zero, but it is very rare. And that's where I think medical gaslighting doesn't significantly exist in the same way that gaslighting in other contexts does. You know, what patients experience is very real. The problem is very real, but the malice that the term implies is not remotely common. In addition to a lack of time, the other core underlying problem that leads to the sense of being gaslit is an asymmetry of information. The clinician, on one hand, has a much better knowledge of how diseases present and has the experience with how the diagnostic process works, how to weigh competing pieces of information like a positive test result for an unlikely disease. While the patient has a much better knowledge of their symptoms and how the condition is impacting their life and what their prior experiences with the medical establishment have been like. It's often hard to have the time in the exam room or the right words for patients to fully convey their experience, just like it's hard for clinicians to have the time or the right words to properly explain their perspective and their knowledge. And thus, a lack of time and insufficient communication perpetuates the information asymmetry, leaving the clinician incompletely informed about the patient's illness and leaving the patient feeling like they've been dismissed. I see the biggest problem with the term medical gaslighting is that because gaslighting has such a negative, rightly so, negative connotation when used more broadly, hearing it applied to medical professionals triggers them to become defensive. The term implies that blame lay with the doctors and nurses' individual failings rather than with the system, like not having enough time for each patient encounter, and this inhibits frank discussion between all of us on how to make things better for patients. So now I'm going to shift to discuss how patients can avoid medical gaslighting. Bring a support person or advocate. This reduces the chance the clinician will outright discount the symptom or be rude in the exam room. However, I do recommend that the support person does not speak more than the patient themselves 
provided the patient is able to speak or otherwise communicate. It is always best to hear directly from the patient rather than having the story filtered by an advocate who may have the absolute best possible intentions, but who will unavoidably enter their own biases into the history. Bring a list of written questions. It's easy to get flustered in the exam room and forget to ask about key things. When the physician sees that the patient has an organized list of questions, they'll be more likely to provide direct specific answers to each one rather than vague generalizations that can feel like a dismissal. It's fine to bring a relevant reference if you are suggesting that you have a specific disease or are spe uh, suggesting a specific test or treatment, but a single reference from a reliable source like the medical literature will be much more helpful than a stack of printed copies of, of random web pages. I suggest not name dropping during the discussion with a doctor. You know, I've had patients uh, who I've, I've seen in the hospital try to convince me that they have some particular diagnosis by quoting a random doctor I've never heard of at some world-renowned institution a thousand miles away. Um, I promise you that doing this uh, is not helpful. There's too much of a risk that something was miscommunicated by the other doctor to the patient uh, or misremembered. However, on the other hand, bringing printed notes from a medical chart that the physician in front of you at that moment wouldn't otherwise have easy access to, that absolutely is very helpful. Lastly, be sure to understand the plan at the end of the encounter. Think of it a little like a business meeting. What specific action items are there and who is responsible for each? So for example, the doctor is going to order text, uh, test X and Y and contact the specialist you saw last week. You as the patient are going to contact another hospital and give them permission to fax some records over. And the clinic nurse is going to call you in three days to check on how your symptoms are doing. Sometimes doing all those things is not enough and you will still be subjected to what you view as medical gaslighting. If it's already happening, how should you respond? I would advise staying calm and respectful, even if the physician is not. Be polite but firm and say something direct like, Dr. Strong, I don't feel like you are listening to my concerns about such and such. Or, Dr. Strong, I don't understand why you think we should not test for this particular disease, can you explain it more to me? For a good physician who is being curt due to stress or time constraints or a recent stressful encounter with a, another patient, maybe two, two or three patients ago, uh, a polite, direct question like that will usually be a trigger for them, getting them to realize, oh, like this is, I can't believe I'm treating this patient like this, and they're going to realize what they're doing, and it's going to change the entire atmosphere of the exam room for the better. Now, that doesn't always work. If the physician has been actively rude or said something racist, sexist, or otherwise inappropriate, or if they don't uh, sh shift the, uh, the atmosphere in response to your direct, polite question, it's within your rights to ask for a supervisor. But as that's unlikely to lead to a timely resolution of your medical problem, some patients choose to seek quietly a second opinion from another doctor or another clinic and to reach out to the previous person's supervisor or patient relations office at a later time when they're feeling better. Now, aside from racist, sexist, or homophobic, homophobic comments or behavior, which you should not tolerate, it's never in your best interest to be hostile to the physician and medical staff taking care of you. Once in a while, a frustrated or upset patient will be believe this incorrect myth that very vocally and forcefully complaining will get things done faster in the hospital or in the clinic, and thus get them better care. In the hospital, at least, the squeaky wheel does not get the grease. Instead, the squeaky wheel gets less in-person assessments, less experienced physicians and staff caring for them, and often more unnecessary and expensive testing, which is used as a substitute for bedside visits. If a physician has to choose between a 15-minute physical exam to rule out a stroke on an argumentative patient, or just ordering a $3,000 brain MRI, which do you think they're going to choose? You know, $3,000 isn't coming out of their pocket. Plus, there's a whole genre of subtext in medical charts to indicate a patient is rude or difficult, which will increase the chance of being gaslit in the future. You do not want that subtext ending up in your chart. Again, I'm not saying this is the way it should be, but this is the way it actually is. Lastly, local or online support groups, particularly for neglected and underappreciated diseases, can be a good source of support, and often members can recommend 
specific doctors who are familiar with a specific disease that you might want to go and uh, reach out to or, or to look up. That's it for my thoughts on medical gaslighting. It is a difficult, difficult problem. There can be an enormous gap between what patients experience and what clinicians intend for them to experience. And that gap can be underappreciated or even invisible to both parties. With patients left believing that physicians and nurses meant to be dismissive or even meant to lie to them, while the physician or nurse is left believing that the patient is being unreasonable. And usually, neither of those things are true. Feel free to ask questions or share your own experiences below.